welcome everybody to uh, I think a very special air, um, art viewing adventures because um, I've just been a huge fan of Sarah's uh, work and I'm looking forward to really showing it to you guys. Sarah, you um, are a, a San Francisco based artist. We're going to talk about where your studio is because folks will have an opportunity to, to um, visit there next month in the middle of the month. Uh, and uh, you, you are a graduate of the um, Art Institute, I believe. Um, actually, CCA. CCA. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll get so into all that. Was, back when it was CCAC. Um, but welcome to Art Viewing Adventures, Sarah. Very pleased to have you. And um, we're going to be showing you a lot of Sarah's work, but if you want to peruse it at your own leisure, uh, highly recommend going to her website, and we'll we'll put that into the chat. But uh, there's there's this. I told Sarah just a few minutes ago. It's really one of the best artist websites I've seen, just in terms of being able to see a really broad cross section of your work. So I first of all, I always like asking artists like, how did you become an artist? What was your path to getting into um, getting into doing all this? Well, I was pretty lucky when I was young. Um, you know, a lot of artists say, oh, my parents didn't want me to be an artist or I was never encouraged to be an artist. And it was a pretty ordinary thing in my family to be an artist. My family lived outside of um, Santa Barbara near the university. And my uncle, who was an artist and he went to Otis, he taught for a while, and then he was the studio manager at UCSB, as well as having his own art practice. He ran an art gallery for three years. My father studied art at UCSB for a while, too, and then he ended up being actually an architectural drafts person, so not a very creative art-making career, but he was also an um, active photographer. And then just... Um, making things was valued in our household. My mother made a lot of my clothes when I was a child, but she didn't just sew them. She also would embroider designs on them. My father made our kitchen cabinets. He made a bed frame and it was intricately carved with flowers and, and vines. Um, my aunt, who is my uncle's wife, had a floor loom in their living room. So it wasn't, um, discouraged at all. And of course, my father took all these different art classes while he was working and I would get the cast off art supplies. So I had oil pastels to work with when I was a little kid instead of crayons and colored pencils and paints. We did printmaking in the garage. Yeah, it, it sounds to me like, you know, you're, you're doing it from a really early age and you're in a very supportive family. And, and, you know, one of the keys to success is just putting in the time and really becoming a master at whatever uh, materials you work with. So so was is, it, is that really part of your story that you were able to start doing this from a very young age? I was. And, you know, I would ask my uncle to critique my work. And then he told me when I was an adult that he was always, you know, very positive, even when it wasn't very good. <laughs> but... <laughs> It, it was, um, it wasn't like people who are like, oh, my parents always wanted me to be an engineer or something like that. Yeah. And then when did you know that it was important to you to, to be an artist, that you were, you were willing to make all the sacrifices? Um, after I finished high school, I, I had lived for a couple of years in Pennsylvania while I was in high school. And then when I was 17, I moved back to Santa Barbara and finished up my degree. And then I was just working for a while, for a couple of years, full time. And I just hadn't really, my uncle took me down to Los Angeles and he took me to Art Center and he took me to Otis and showed me his old studio when I was 17, but I didn't really have the confidence to go to art school. So I was working for a couple of years here and I started taking classes at San Francisco City College which at that time had a fantastic art department. They had a printmaking studio out at Fort Mason with etching classes, monoprint classes, um, woodblock printing classes. And the wonderful thing was that you could take separate classes in all of these media and then you could advance through levels. So I had a chance to 
take these classes and I just, um, I was grabbed by printmaking right away as a medium. I loved it. And I was able to build up some confidence there in, um, not so much in my art, but in going to school. So, and I met um, some wonderful teachers, actually Diane Olivier, who taught drawing and figure drawing there for a long time, and was one of my teachers and wrote me a letter of recommendation when I went to CCAC, is now a neighbor of mine in 1890 Bryant. So she has her studio right down the hall. So it's wonderful to reconnect with her in that way now. But it took a couple years for me to decide that I really wanted to um, make this the primary thing that I did. Yeah, and we I've been showing your images, and I guess we should really tell folks a few things about them. First of all, um, these are these these are very, very realistic. It's I would call it photorealism, um, not to say it's part of a genre, it's just what you do. And they're drawings, you know, they are very intricately drawn. Um and then, um, you know, we're going to talk about the kind of these places that you're portraying. But let me ask, like, how would you describe your artistic style in your approach to your art? Well, like you said, it's representational. And um, I typically I, I'm attracted to things, built environments, landscape work mostly and places where you see people's hand on the landscape because I'm interested in, in this, the ideas about how we live that are embodied in what we do with our environments. So yeah. I'm not really a, a nature painter, but I'm, I'm interested in how we relate to our landscape, how we use it, and what does it say about our hopes and our fears and our, our desires. Yeah, and um, I wanted you to read a statement that's on your website um, about some of these, about the series of works um, that are on the Bayfront. Um, you you call it the four the four ground? Is that it? The, the foreshore. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah, sure. Let me pull that up. Um, so these are all drawings from around the edge of the bay. And there's a 500 mile trail planned to run the whole circumference of the entire San Francisco Bay, as you well know, Rodney. And right now it's about 350 miles of it are complete. This completed distance is not a continuous length, but it's separated by gaps where access to the shore is blocked. And what I wrote was, it is a marginal zone here where industries and people are pushed out to the edges of the populated areas to face away from the cities and suburbs. Power plants, airports, trailer parks, jails, concrete yards, and other urban outliers stand near the water's edge. It is also a marginal zone in that it is the very edge of the ocean, fragile, constantly changing, and it is in this shifting boundary that the effects of our hand on the environment will begin to appear. The trail was approved in 1987, 30 years before I began attempting to walk the unfinished sections, as close as was possible to the planned route of the trail, although in many places access is impossible. I've been sketching, photographing, and making drawings of the unimproved landscape as I go. These drawings are of the discernible endpoints of the trail sections where they hit the construction sites, industry, and restricted areas that prevent the trail from completing the circuit. Many of those obstacles, like airports, petroleum storage tanks, power stations, are linked directly to the future changes that could imperil their own landscape. In the naming of coastal zones, the foreshore is the area between the high and low water lines most influenced by the changing tides. It is also less specifically the area between the water and developed land. To me, the name has an echo of apprehension or expect expectancy is what I wrote. Forecast, foresight, foreshadow. This trail has been under construction 30 years. In 30 more years, where will this zone be? And that's something I really started thinking about as I was walking um and encountering the different ways that different communities 
are approaching the idea of sea level rise. If you look at some place like, say, Foster City, which is such an engineered use of the waterfront versus, say, in the South Bay, where I think it's the Don Edwards mm -hmm. wetlands restoration is happening, where they're really making an effort to buffer the effects of sea level rise by doing such a large wetlands restoration. There's just such a contrast as you go from place to place. Yeah, and it's just so, it, you know, of course, it's at the core of our region. Um, there was a period where we were kind of battling the bay, trying to, um, you know, fill in the bay. Yeah. And, you know, the the the, way you, the bay trail and um, the things in the 80s were an effort to really go in the other direction. I was but, amazed it, to learn that the bay model was created to study whether they could actually just fill the whole bay in up to where what the San Mateo Bridge is basically. And mm -hmm. build it. yeah. it's a it's a crazy story. I um you know I have this other program I used to do called Bay Area Bay Area Trails Confidential, and we talked about the uh, re rebar um, project, which was this guy's vision to. Um, Fill in the bay. He was going to have, I think, something like a 32-lane highway between San Francisco and Oakland. And uh, what really literally sunk it was the U.S. Navy, who um, realized that, that it would make it impossible for them to quickly move ships out of the uh, Bay Area. So kind of a lot of irony in all that. Yeah. Speaking of which, is this this is like a Coast Guard or some kind of military? That's uh, the facility. Oakland Airport. Oh, it's Oakland Airport. Okay. Yeah. So, sort of from the um, from Doolittle Road. That's where the Martin Luther King Recreation Area is, and the Bay Trail goes through there. But it's broken many times um, with gaps that are short. So I have a number of drawings from there. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I wanted to um, see if you can find the one I was telling you about just a few minutes ago. Um, the one by the Oakland Airport, which actually has a building where a friend of mine has his office. If I can find that, I do. That one's that. called Doolittle Road. That's helpful. Oh, it'll 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 talk, turn up in yeah. all this. So that's um, Treasure Island, which has been an interesting place to walk because every time I go there, it's changed. It, that's true, and there's a lot going on there right now. Um, if you know, you look at this image and you're you're seeing kind of disrupted nature. Uh, you're seeing these houses in the background. And, and then and then, of course, what my eye is drawn to is this sign right here, which uh, shows radioactivity. And there is radioactivity there. And that has actually slowed down the project. I think there's a lot of um, cleanup going on. Uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting place. Um, from an economic standpoint, because it has both um, these these new condos for pretty wealthy people, and it has some real low income housing also, and there's no really nobody in between there. Yeah, pretty fascinating place. So you are you are in the process of walking around the entire bay, right? Tell tell me about your circumnavigation of the bay. Um, I headed down the peninsula I just I started the whole thing just by chance really which is it's kind of how I start everything because I'm not one of those artists who like has big ideas I don't suddenly have an inspiration that I'm gonna follow through if I'm not drawing and doing things I'm not really thinking creatively and so I just have to be drawing all the time and I took a walk down near um, the Brisbane Lagoon. Mm -hmm. And I came across a little stub of the Bay Trail there. I was trying to walk to the Brisbane Lagoon from um, Caltrain Station or the Nine San Bruno or something along the shore. And there's this fairly elaborate section of Bay Trail that has some public art elements. And then it suddenly ends at the Candlestick Park freeway on-ramp like you cannot you can't go any further and I thought wow that I'm not sure what this is or why 
people put so much work into this trail that leads here to this freeway on ramp. And I found another way to get to the Brisbane Lagoon, but I was curious and I came back and started reading about the Bay Trail online. And it just made me wonder what the ends of all these disconnected segments were like. Were they all so abrupt and discontinuous or did they sort of blend into the communities? Why couldn't it be completed? What was in the way? And so I got interested in taking a look and started heading down the peninsula and I'm now up in the Vallejo area. I just walked over the Benicio Martinez Bridge on Friday. That was exciting. Uh huh. Yeah. Didn't. <laughs> so, but I'm realizing that because I use public transit, I I may be unable to complete the circuit. Yeah, you and I you you and I spoke about this. I'm I do it on a bicycle. Yeah. Uh, in in you you know there's Highway 37, which is considered the Bay Trail, although it's not a completed part of the Bay Trail. Right. Uh, legally, you can bicycle or walk along Highway 37. I would I'd say it's a very, very bad idea to do either, in my opinion. Um, what I ended up doing was going through the area north of that in the Carneros region of Napa and Sonoma counties. Um, but you, you're still kind of figuring out what you want to do with that, right, Sarah? Yeah, because it's about 35 miles from Mare Island, which is, I think, the last place I could reach by the Vallejo Ferry, and then over to past Sears Point on the other side, where I could connect with Golden Gate Transit. And I can't walk 35 miles in a day. I mean, maybe, maybe I can, but I can't do that and think about making drawings at the same time. And yeah. so I'm not sure if I'm going to leave that part out or how I'm going to approach it. Well, if you wait long enough, someday they will probably need to rebuild Highway 37 because of sea level rise. And when they rebuild it, they do plan, I think, to have a pedestrian bicycle um, portion of it or section, you know, so that it's safe to do that. Yeah, but it's terrible. I actually was there recently because I had to, um, my brother has a some children and they all had to do different things one weekend. One of them had to be in Boston, one of them had to be in Monterey, and one of them had to be in Santa Rosa. So they were outnumbered and I had to go up and help out. So I, I drove up there and I drove on 37. I also realized that if you want to stop and see something and it's on the other side of the road, you are completely out of luck <laughs> because right. it's a divided highway and you have to drive all the way to Vallejo and turn around and come back. So yeah. yeah, I traversed it several times trying to find something that I overshot the first time and then it was on the wrong side of the road. And then I think I finally made it there. There's some, there's like a, some park areas that are just north of 37 that are um, kind of fairly close to Vallejo um, that are pretty interesting actually. And that's part of, it's not the Don Edwards uh, national, what do we call it? It's it, it's a wildlife refuge. This yeah. one's got a different name. Um, not somebody in the audience will will know, especially um, because this we actually have Ron Edward. Ron Rory out there, who is another Bay Trail um, obsessive. I I would I hope you don't mind me calling you that, Ron. <laughs> who, who does great photography of the Bay Trail, and, and Ron may know what the name of that is. I think this uh, is Don Edwards yeah. in the picture, actually. I think it is. Is is this is Alviso? Right. Um, you and I kind of met over Alviso because I I asked if I could use your photographs for my Bay Trail program about Alviso. Um, tell tell me like like what is it about Alviso that that really draws you in? Um, it wasn't anything specific. It would just happen to be one of the places. I never know what I'm going to find when I go there. So, you know, this is the end of one trail section where I think I had to walk out the Guadalupe River Trail to get to the Bay Trail from the right. ETA. And then it stops and then the other one is a little bit further south. 
out by the water treatment plant. But um, yeah, I never know what it's going to be like. And I just have to spend some time in that place trying to figure out what it is about it that I want to communicate in the drawing that is, um, like I said, working from photographs, I'm, I'm not trying to find something specific, you know, like a object or a sign. I don't want to make a painting of something that I would take a photograph of, if that makes any sense. They're not snapshotty. There's no discernible subject necessarily. They are an environment. They're a picture of a place. Yeah. Oh, Ron, Ron is saying, by the way, what we were just talking about was the San Pablo Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you, Ron. Yeah, but let, let's like like this one specifically. Let's talk about this image. Um, you, so maybe you think if this was a photograph, we would be less interested in this. Um, I'm saying it's not something like I take photographs of an interesting sign, or I think like I have one drawing that I'm I'm not sure how I feel about it because it's a a pond this is up in the north bay and it has a semi-submerged shopping cart in it and when people look at it in the studio and they focus on that and they say oh, what is that oh look oh it's a shopping cart oh and then like they get it you know like oh i got the joke and i'm done looking kind of thing <laughs> you know what i mean i mean Whereas, i i want this to be an environment. So it is about the salt ponds and it is about the tide, but it's not about one specific aspect. Of I mean, to me, the fact that this is a drawing in that the fence is just like so intricately done, you know, like it must have been, that must have been, it, it, first of all, very, very hard to render that. And it must have taken you a lot of time. And, and it's, you know, it's show, it's just really to me saying this is, you know, how we impose ourselves on the natural environment. You know, yeah. and it's kind of funny. What a funny place to have a fence, too, right? Right. Also, yeah, uh, with it's, this... a, it's a remnant of something, and you're not necessarily sure what, but you know that the land had a different purpose at some time or that someone's made that big of an effort to keep you out. Yeah. And so there's a reason for that, but what is it? And then the gate, the gate above it, I mean, what, like that obviously is some remnant of something, right? Is it, yeah. it doesn't serve any purpose now. Uh, and is this, is this uh, at high tide in this location or, because I know Alvisa is a little funny because it has its own kind of, water level regulation going on but it seems like right. this and there was time. a kind of water outlet thing very close to there yeah so i'm not sure some places i go back to um at high tide or low tide or different times of the day if i think it would be helpful um some places i only make it to once yeah uh, tell me about like you you put the elevation of all these places and i think for me it really reminds us of just how precarious their existence is given sea level rise and an uncertain future but is that like what what was going on in your mind with the elevations that is why i put it in and it was as i started walking and reading about the bay trail and how long it had taken to get the Bay Trail built to the point of completion that it's at now and thinking about how much longer it might take, especially since in their description of how it was built, they say, oh, they did the easiest sections first and what's left are the ones that are going to be more difficult to complete, like the San Francisco airport. How are you going to approach that in building a trail? If it took another 30 years and at, at that time also, you know, these predictions about sea level rise are constantly being revised. So yeah. in I which direction? Put the elevation in 
To that's a good question. I think um, what's direction? I think I think the sea level rise predictions continue to get worse, right, Sarah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so three feet, maybe at one time meant something different than three feet does now. Right. Right. Um, so this this image, it's uh, one of the questions I want to ask you is like, how do you decide what to include and not include in your paintings? And I think what you've done here is really, um, I just, first of all, um, you know, I love like the triangle shape that emerges from uh, from this part of it. And um, I don't know, to me, the fact that we, we are seeing these details and some are excluded really makes the image pop. But what what is your thinking on that? There's a couple of things. A part of it is just, I'm trying to make an interesting composition like you do in any kind of picture making, whether it's abstract or representational, something where your eye moves through the picture in a dynamic way and you don't get stuck in certain places or it doesn't feel like separate pieces that don't read together. And part of it is that um, I wanted to have a sort of a semi-retained feeling, a semi-complete feeling as if it were a memory or, you know how when you conjure something up in your mind, it's not like a snapshot. Mm -hmm. It's it's a little bit fleeting and it's a little bit loose around the edges. And because, yeah. you know, every time you go somewhere, it's different. This is not a picture of a place simply it's like a picture of a place at a very particular time that's gone now and so I wanted it to have a little bit of that feeling of appearing or disappearing or not quite being able to hold on to it so it's it's almost dreamlike although it's it's like realistic and dreamlike at the same time right and I like this one has, it is largely about triangles. You know, there's the two ones in, in the grass and then there's a sort of a cloud triangle. And it's also just very satisfying to me from a compositional point of view. I have to say, and I don't know if, how people in the audience feel about this. The fact that these are all places in the Bay Area, um, I find that really that really draws me in, you know, it makes me, you know, I look at these things and I think, do I know this place? Have I been here? Um, and in fact, I have been to this location. We don't have a title for this slide, but this is um, Martinez. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, I think it's a park that's like just north of Martinez. It's a really wonderful place on the bay. It's Alhambra um, Creek. Oh, it's not it? very far at all from the Amtrak station. Yeah, yeah, it's near the Amtrak station. In fact, that would be a great thing. Someone could take, you could take Amtrak up there and visit right. it. Um, Marsha has a question. Go ahead, Marsha. Well, you know, um, I when I first looked at this, I thought the trail was ground. Now I'm thinking it's water with, you know, reeds and such. And then I heard you say it doesn't exist anymore. So oh, it does, just not exactly like this ah uh, well where were you in a boat taking this shot or, or is this land i'm that is question, water sure. and i was standing on a small bridge ah, ah okay. now, um the bridge is at the end of the section of the bay trail there where you go then into martinez town okay. proper starting to and i and didn't mean that the place i mean in some places the places don't exist anymore or they're transformed but i think this is fundamentally the same but it won't be just like this i see what you're saying i've got you and as someone who does not create art i'm looking at this the the mass of the brambles or whatever on the right the larger triangle mm -hmm. and just to have tried to render the white from the you know, the light from the dark i mean that takes a massive focus in my opinion and it must it's something you must have that I do not. <laughs> but also there are things I don't I don't work in color. 
very much. And I was talking to Rodney about this earlier. I sort of struggle with um, using color in my artwork, except in a very restrained way. And I'm sort of jealous of artists who have a really innate color sense. Everybody has, you know, their different places where they dig in. And, and you yeah, dig my... in the shades, the grays and the whites. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my opinion, Sarah, is that you sh you don't need to be jealous that this is this is totally wonderful the way it is um, without color. And, um, you know, kind of reminds me of like the power of a black and white photograph over something that's color, that it, some, something about it that um, really gets us at the essence of the place of the um, uh, the structure of it, you know. And I told Sarah this when we were looking at this earlier, um, this piece in particular reminds me that, you know, sometimes we we look at artists or even different kinds of like music, whatever, we think, oh, if I could be an artist, this is the kind of artist I would want to be. And that was my reaction to this, Sarah, is like, I mean, the person who's jealous is me of you. I would love to be able to be um, this kind of an artist and do like photorealism, um, especially of places on the Bay, you know, because I love the Bay, so. Thank you, I uh, don't mean to embarrass you, but um, I do. Yeah. Maybe jealous isn't the right word, but sometimes when you see a painting that somebody's made and you just think, I wish I could do that, you know. Yeah. We can't all do everything. Well, you, you, you have me thinking, you're saying, I don't like my work in color or other people have, have said they don't like your, you know. <laughs> I struggle with it. Yeah. Because it just doesn't feel realistic to you once you Yeah, it do? doesn't. Um... It doesn't come to me the same way working in black and white. Like I have a feeling for working in black and white and how much black there is, how much white there is. How does that affect the way your eye moves to the image? Is it mostly about light things? Is it mostly about dark things? And people who paint in color are, are obviously thinking about other things that my brain doesn't just naturally think about. Wow. And, and it's doing me wonders to hear you verbalize about how your mind works because you are talking to a non-artist you know mm -hmm. so, thank you don't don't assume i know thank you though thank we have you. a couple of of questions and thoughts in chat that i want to call out um roger says to me it looked like water right away since i am a water guy terrific plus i love to sketch so roger um you know and i think that's a good question actually sarah is like rendering water that that is that is always really um, a very specialized skill, right? It's so different a lot all the time too, depending on the light and the wind and the depth of the water. And so it's not something you can just come up with as sort of a Bob Ross shorthand for you're gonna put the waves over here. It's always changing. Right, water isn't just water. Water is many, many different things. In fact, we're, we're going to get a little bit later on to um, uh, one of your favorite artists, and we have a work she did that is of water. That's very different from this. Um, I want to get to Ron's question. Um, he asks, what medium do you use? Uh, do you paint from photos or plain air? So those are two different questions. Tell us about like the uh, the medium of this. The medium is India ink wash. So that's black India ink, like you buy in a small bottle. And then it's diluted with water to make the different values. So it can be very watered down for light gray or very intense for the darker values. And then the white is gouache, which is opaque watercolor. And I like the way the gouache um, because it's opaque, really sits up on top of the surface of the paper. The paper itself is gray. So I'm working from both ends of the value spectrum in towards the middle. So I'm working the lights and the dark simultaneously. But I like using that mid-toned paper too. It, it, it gives you a little bit of a connection to sort of 19th century landscape painter sketches. I don't know if you've ever seen any of their drawings from Yosemite or anything like that. They often used toned paper. 
or even um, Renaissance artists would draw on toned paper. So it does. Oh, like we saw it in Botticelli, right? The Botticelli. Yeah, those were drawing program. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My my favorite one was the one of the little um, sculpture of the head. I don't know if you saw that one. I think so. We did a whole we did a program about that. That was that was really just a real mind blowing exhibition. Um. Uh, Ron also asked, like, do you paint from photos or plein air? Yeah, I do paint from photographs, and I I sketch some from plein air, but it doesn't look at all like my drawings that you're seeing now. Um, it's really different working from photographs than it is working outside because when you take a photograph, so much has already happened with like flattening your environment into a two-dimensional thing and when you work from life you have to do that work yourself so I tend to just take a tremendous number of photographs to bring back to the studio with me um, I'll sit down I'll stand up I'll walk back and forth take them from different angles I'll take pictures of the sky and pictures of the ground I'm just using my phone I'm a terrible photographer but I want to get some different exposures and things like that so that when I get back to the studio, I can look at the different photographs. I'm not painting from just one, I'm painting from numerous photographs and using them as reference for different parts of the object. And oftentimes like the whole thing wouldn't fit into one photograph anyway, the vantage point I'm at. But when I sketch outside, it's much, I think there's a couple slides of those, the little so sketches. The sketches that you sent? Like yeah. like that? Yeah. So this is something in my sketchbook that I did sitting on the sidewalk. And there's also just a lot of things that are distracting about working outside. Like maybe the light is too bright on your paper or the wind is blowing and it blows all your stuff over or somebody wants to talk to you about something. So in these, I'm just trying to get the geometry and sort of a basic value shorthand but as you can see they're not very detailed compared to the other drawings that I do and if I were to do one of those drawings outside I would have to go back day after day and hope that the light was the same and that I could get set up in the same place people do that I admire them the, the artists that <laughs> we, these really remind me of are uh, is, is Robert Bechtel I love uh, Robert Bechtel yeah, in a, this right. is like Petrero Hill, so this is sort of his turf. Yes, right? yeah. one of his places. Plus, he he really loved putting in things like signs, and um, and wires and utility poles and things like that. This so, one looks like there's a fire on the on the it's left. A background. laundromat. Oh, so it's, it's just the light, I guess, right? Yeah, it was very brightly lit inside. And then mm -hmm. it had this sort of textured wall, stucco wall on the outside. And you can see there's like a little light on the far left that is kind of showing some of the texture of the wall. But again, it's just sort of a brushy shorthand for that. Right, right. Cool. And then for something completely different, let's talk about these um, these muni charcoal drawings that you, you did. Like, How did this come about? Um, this came about because I'm a, a member of a nonprofit called the San Francisco Transit Writers Union. And during the COVID shutdowns, Muni wasn't running trains underground. They were taking that opportunity to do a lot of maintenance work. And um, as a member of this group, I got a chance to take a tour going from Church Street up towards Forest Hill, but we didn't quite go that far. And I just, um, I took a camera that I borrowed from my studio mate, who's a photographer, because you weren't allowed to use your cell phone down there. And also she had a very good, it was a point and shoot camera, but it was a very good camera for a point and shoot. And I just um, took a lot of pictures on the trail. Every Everybody else who was on the tour was sort of interested in transit infrastructure and they had a lot of questions about like the wire splicing and the new track switching and I was just kind of in the back you know I don't usually have people in my work because um 
you immediately relate to the people in the work. So the work I'm doing about the Bay Trail is more about place. And if there are people, they're very small and sort of off in the distance. But I tried to take people-less photographs on this tour, but of course we're all bunched together. And then when I got back home, because I wasn't working at the studio at that time because of COVID, I I was feeling very isolated at during that time in my life. And I started to relate to these figures with the lights in these dark environments and especially the way with photography, you know, you can't really see into the dark but but you have somebody there with a beacon kind of like looking into this impenetrable darkness and it just um it became very meaningful to me and I ended up doing all these drawings of figures in them which I don't usually do yeah I think um it, it's really intriguing and another you know you're really good at doing with like light and dark and, and kind of bringing that to life, I think. And, and then I have to say, I really love um, this graffiti. In, yeah, in that the, was the only graffiti, you know, people would ask me and they'd be like, were there rats? Was there graffiti? And of course they had really cleaned it all up. And so it was very tidy, except here they were in the middle of some work. So there's some track stuff that they pulled up, but that was some of the only graffiti we saw on our tour to say. I'm glad you included that. Um, we have some, some more questions in chat. I want to, um, first of all, Paco says that um, this reminds him of the Chinatown subway. Um, probably it's a little cleaner down there so far. <laughs> they had a tour of that one too before it opened, but I didn't get a spot on that one. Yeah, Roger says, fun to get to look in the tunnels that we usually speed through. I think I'm going to show another, I got some other images that um, show some tunnels. I had a time um, recently on BART where I could see the tunnel between um, the two downtown Oakland BART stations. And it's just, I was just starting to think about, well, what's it like in there? Because you can really see, you can see from one station to the next. I just went into the tube. Oh, yeah? I did because I wanted to take pictures, but then I didn't end up getting any good pictures. But I, I did it by volunteering with the fire department because they do an evacuation drill. Um, every February, they do wow. several and they have to do it between one and six o'clock in the morning because that's when trains aren't running. So they, mm -hmm. they need people to volunteer to go into the tube and be evacuated. So, so oh, I went I into the bar tube and volunteered to be evacuated. Oh, OK. Maybe we should all do that next year. That sounds very cool. It was, you have, you have to be there at one thirty in the morning, though. I'm willing to do that. Totally. Um, no, why, so am I the, forgive me, but I was also curious, you said you're a member of this transit riders. Is that like going on a ride along with the police officers? In other words, you, you are simply um, um, given a chance to see what you normally don't see, or do you perform a function down there? Do you sell your art back to this agency or? Oh, no, the transit riders is actually a, an advocacy organization. So mm -hmm. they're a nonprofit that I joined. I, I paid their membership fee and they advocate for better transit in San Francisco and around the Bay Area, but primarily in San Francisco. And they do have these membership events sometimes where they'll arrange with MTA to get some kind of behind the scenes look at transit. But it's I'm not art specific. I did an event for them last September where I held a, a transit-themed art show at 1890 Bryant as part of Transit Month, which is wow. Wow. Transit Month. But generally, it's not very um, art-oriented. I'm OK, OK. State I think planning. we need more of that. You know, I, I, lo I love transit, too. And I, um, uh, you know, I, I really try to use it as much as I can. I know, Sarah, you, you're obviously big on doing that. You're doing this whole. Bay Trail circumnavigation without using a car. Um, so, so yeah, this this is really because this is the stuff we see all the time. Um, the other thing I'll say about these are a series that you did on BART. Yeah. BART stations. Tell tell us about that actually. Sure. Um, well, like I was saying, I don't really. 
get ideas suddenly like I'm going to make a suite of etchings about BART, but I don't know if you've ever been to the Glen Park BART station. The big Glen Park BART station has fascinating architecture. It has these huge concrete vaults and you ride up and down the escalators through this cavernous space that sort of made me think of like um, Piranesi etching or something. And then I saw a film, I went to the, um, what is that? The Prelinger Archives has a film event, Lost Landscapes, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And they played a clip from a promotional video from BART from maybe 1967 or when, when the BART stations were being built. And it was so fascinating. It had this, um, announcer with the voice you know bart here for you kind of someone had written a folk song about bart which was in the video they showed the architectural models and they talked about it in just such um they they quoted lewis mumford when they talked about bart you know it was so idealistic and of course the experience that people were having then with the construction of bart like it didn't serve some people very well. They say it destroyed the economy of Mission Street, pretty much having the street torn up. So obviously they were trying to present it in a certain way. But there was this idea of the common good in this film that I feel like we're losing with our Uber and Lyft and private shuttles and that you might build something that would benefit everybody, even if they don't use it. That, you know, by many people taking BART, it makes it easier for other people to sometimes not take BART. And it's a commons that we all own together. I think feel like these are ideas that are falling out of fashion. And I want oh, to- I, I totally agree with you. I, I think the things we all own together are particularly precious. Yeah, uh, especially in this time when we're all being torn apart in, you know, when you have like public parks, when you have public transportation, uh, you, you actually get to see a big cross section of people and you get to be with um, your fellow man, but maybe people with from different ethnic groups, different socioeconomic groups, um, but we're all there together. It belongs to everybody. Yeah. And I love that about it. But I thought, well, how does this relate to people's day-to-day -day experience of BART now? So I started going to these different BART stations. And then I had the opportunity to participate in an exhibition where each artist had to make 16 pieces that were related in small scale and exhibit the 16 pieces together. So I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to explore the stations of the original BART system and see how they're being lived in. Well, sometimes literally, but I didn't mean that that way. Um, but how they're being used, how they're part of people's day-to-day -day life. What remnants of that idealism are still there? Do people experience it? So um, I made 16 etchings of BART stations. And I was also thinking about Piranesi at the same time. Who but was... I noticed you, 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 um, we have the backgrounds, we have the trains, we have a few of the stationary objects, benches and phones and staircases. Um, were you there in the middle of the night doing these where there were no humanoids or? Um, no, um, sometimes I took the people out. Some of them have some people. I don't know if you have 19th Street. That one probably has the most figures in it. But I there were people there. That one. But I also, you know, I was trying to, like here I was lying on the ground of the Embarcadero BART station. So I did try and not make too much of a spectacle out of myself while taking the pictures. And I did them all from the interior and the exterior in daytime and nighttime before I decided how I was going to present each of the stations. There's yeah. quite a bit of drama. I, I'm a pre particularly yeah. this one. I mean, um, I, I was having this um, uh, imagination for a moment that your pictures would be found sometime in the future, but this would be the, 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 the visualization, the testament to what modern 
people had done in 20th, 21st century. Um, Cause there's something both super dramatic about it. And yet this is very utilitarian, you know. That's uh, wonderful because I think that's kind of what I was trying to get at. I mean, this is kind of an amazing thing and we just complain about it all the time. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I don't know, but you know, it's good you to, talk to people about it. Bart, see what they have to say. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I we all have our issues with Bart. At least I do. But um, boy, I would if you took it away, I'd be I'd be d despondent, you know. Yeah. Um, I I, have, I want to mention one photographer that these works remind me of, and it's a uh, Lee Friedlander. He, oh yeah. Uh, I love how he takes things that are familiar and then portrays them from like angles that you're not used to seeing and you kind of experience them in new ways. And I feel like you're doing that same thing. Um, particularly feel that about, I got to get to it. This, the, the one of the uh, Berkeley, this one. Oh yeah. This, that's gone. That's gone now. Yeah. That's that. right. They redid that station. Yeah. Uh, I want to get to a couple of things in chat. And then I want to make sure everybody knows about the opportunity to go and, and meet you in person and go to your studio. Um, but I know um, there was a question about, do you use different size brushes? Um, no, I mostly stick with like a four watercolor brush. And it's a nice brush. It's a sable brush. And so you can get a really fine point on it. But it holds enough water that you can do a wash and it's very versatile. Um, and also if you look up close, you'll see that some of the things that look very detailed are actually just brushwork. Just sort of taking the side of the brush and doing a little dry brush technique. And then if certain things in the image are very detailed, then those other things just kind of fall into place, even though they're not rendered the same way. This, this is what comes from you, you've spent like your whole life doing drawings. I, I I get the feeling, Sarah, like you've got many, many years of experience with this. Yeah. And printmaking, too, is another thing that like it takes many years to get really good at. So let's let's tell people about visiting your studio, because I think that's really important. So you are at 1890 Bryant Street. Um, which is ADA accessible, thank, mm -hmm. thank goodness. Um, and April 12th, 13th, and 14th is open studios, spring open studios for, for 1890. It's not it's not everywhere in the city like it is in the fall. I mean, there are some other studios in the mission that you can visit to. Art Explosion might be open Maybe. that same weekend. In the but Alabama it's just in the mission. We had a couple of artists from Alabama Street um, I think it was four weeks ago, and they're they're also open that weekend. Um, but 1890 is just particularly fabulous because you've got a hundred artists in this building, and you can really you should really like budget a lot of time at 1890. You but spend most of it with day. Sarah. And you need to bring your lunch. It's exhausting. <laughs> uh, you guys, but have it's a wonderful nice... because there, there's a ceramics studio. There are people working in sculpture and printmaking, drawing, painting, people making jewelry. So the nice thing about it is that there's none of that. When you go out to the open studios and it's in someone's home, for example, and you go in and maybe you don't connect with the artwork, there's none of that awkwardness of <laughs> having to. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean, Rodney. Um, yeah, you know, you can, uh, well, you can kind I always of have something until you find the things that like really grab you. And actually I have something to say, but but I do feel like we all are entitled to pick and choose what we like. Oh, yeah. And, and it, it does. I mean, you, you can't. Most people are not going to love everything. I, I feel it's like like your friends. You know, I love human beings and everything, but I'm only friends with a few people like and they're really special to me. Uh, I'm not friends with absolutely everybody, although I love everybody who tunes in for Art Viewing Adventures, of course. That goes without saying. Um, so to get to 1890, um, here's the way you would get there from the 16th Street BART station. Um, you would you could just walk down uh, 16th Street and then go, you probably would want to go on 17th Street. That's a little nicer, actually. It is nicer. And then, um, oh, we're getting we a new picture. We didn't talk about the uh, buses. 
brought me. About the? The 27 stops oh, right that's, in front that's, of our that's front true. door on 16th that's right. Street are the 22, the 33, and the 55. And then just a couple blocks over on Potrero is the 9. So Which makes sense yeah. because this is where yeah. Muni yeah. lives. Yeah. <laughs> right? You're like across the street from a, a big Muni depot. Um, but I also wanted to mention um, it's yeah, I thought I had it in there. It's very there's very good bike access to this area too. Um, if you if you use the bike share bikes, there's a bike share kiosk nearby, and um, I think I think you're pretty. It's pretty safe to lock up bikes around there. Although don't wouldn't no. take a fancy e bike. Bring your Not, bicycle inside. Bring your bicycle inside, which bring you can do. Inside. You can you can leave it in the hallway. It's okay. We won't judge you for it. It won't last outside. <laughs> okay, so don't do not park it outside. Yeah. Um, there is like a um someone at the door. There's someone who there is someone is, at the door. Yeah. Let's yeah, see. We only have a couple more passenger elevators, so you know you can easily bring yourself, your bicycle, your wheelchair, whatever you use to get around with you. Cool. And and I'm sorry. I just want to be clear. If I tell friends about this it is an open studios it's just a limited open studios it is an open studio that weekend okay, okay only thank you. normally the building is locked and we're messy and busy and but this weekend we kind of tidy the place up and we hire someone to stand at the front door and tell people where the various studios are and we're all there ready to talk to people yeah, it's funny. You, you and I, Sarah, had had we'd spoken before on Zoom and by email, but it was in the fall. Open Studios. I got to actually meet you in person for the first time, which was, uh, you know, I don't know. You you and I are just very like minded about a bunch of things. Oh, we didn't we didn't mention your favorite artist. I uh, one of your favorite artists, but I want to. Oh yeah, I do you want to mention that? I mean, you were uh, saw at the museum. Yeah, so there was a great exhibition. I'm, I'm just going to jump to these paintings. Um, hold on. 2019-ish. Nope. It was before. It was before COVID started. Yes, yeah, so via Selman's um, great exhibition. At, it was definitely before COVID started because we had wonderful SF MoMA tours of this, which yeah. we don't have anymore, sadly. Um, but via Selman's, another. Um, artists who does amazing intricate drawings, um, really great at rendering water, as you can see here. I mean, this is like, yeah. it's just hard to believe these are drawings and not photographs. Those are, yeah, she does graphite drawings, often of, from the same reference photo over and over again, although you can see that they're a little bit different. But I've, I've really enjoyed hearing her talk I'm never able to do that in person because she had to cancel her artist talk at the MoMA but I think there's an art 21 episode with her where she talks about the time that she spends on her drawings and how hopefully that time imbues the drawings with an extra dimension like that time somehow lives in the drawing and how she often paints things over and over again until she has exactly the surface that she wants. And um, I appreciate that. And also I appreciate her dedication to the image, even though her relationship to her imagery is really different than mine. I'm trying to depict a particular place and she's trying to create a certain kind of surface, but she still has that, that dedication to the image that I love. Well, I think you're both terrific, and um, okay. I, I think we, we want, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. But um, Sarah, I really want to thank you for coming on Art Viewing Adventures. Thank you. Um, really want to um, encourage people to go and visit your website, which is uh, sarahhnewton.com. So go to that website, and you can then you can peruse even more of these images, and um, get over to 1890 Bryant. Uh, in mid-April because you will not regret it. It will be a great experience. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you, you so much.
Thank you. In a, th appreciate all the great comments. I have one more comment from Peter and Kevin. They were noting that the Embarcadero BART station was very beautiful when it first opened. Um, it's still, I guess, I guess it needs to be spruced up, but it's still pretty amazing. <laughs> it had that. Everything they tried to do to clean it up made it worse. <laughs> yeah. And that's from an architect's point of view. Yes. <laughs> It used I, to have I, this piece of public art. I don't know if you remember. It was Texas. Yes. It got so it was healthy. It got so healthy. with dirt. Oh, yeah. gross. Yeah. yeah. They they weren't able to clean. And when they went, they went to uh, clean all those the terrazzo walls, the circles, yeah. like portions of the circles, and they ground it down to make it a textured surface so it holds every pit of dirt, and you yeah. really can't clean anything. It's a challenging environment for public art, that's for sure. Yeah, don't get me started on all the conduit and the surface mounted all over the place and the mess they made of that and the lighting. <laughs> the, the lighting used to be all uplights with those fins. Oh, it yeah. Was the fins, it was all uplight. It wasn't efficient, <laughs> but... The, the was... lighting is a, a little rough in some of those stations. But, oh, but yeah. that's, what, that's what's so great about what Sarah does is you take these things and you, you have captured the the essence of them and you maybe leave out some of this other stuff that you yes. don't want to be. <laughs> or I, I tried to present them in their in their best possible. 